is that when an issue arises, you get to see so many different reactions to it. Something like Facebook, for example. It's not like standing with a group of people having a conversation. It would be unusual in a group of people having a conversation to have someone open discussion by saying, can you believe what all those idiots are saying about dot, dot, dot? Because some of the idiots might be standing in front of you. But if you go on a Facebook page and you scroll around a little bit, sometimes you'll see people reacting to issues. And sometimes I think we all state our opinion and do it in a way that sounds like our opinion is the undisputable truth. But if you scroll down a little further, you'll find someone taking the other side of the issue and maybe doing the same thing, saying their opinion is like the undisputable truth. And sometimes you'll see a third opinion. But sadly, I think there are a few times, at least my observation, where you see people of highly divergent opinions discuss a subject in a civil manner. The ability to share really different opinions between people, I think, is something of a lost art in our society. If it was ever any, if it was ever something that people were good at at all. I think the truth is human beings have trouble <coughs> sharing different opinions. It's hard for all of us to take ideas that are foreign to us and work them into our concept of what reality ought to look like. And if there was space in the time of Jeremiah, those pages would have been filled with highly divergent and passionate <coughs> ideas. We know this because we can see in the Holy Scriptures differences of opinion about why life happens. Like life happens. And Jeremiah showed up in the midst of a whole lot of happening. What Jeremiah was experiencing, what the people of Israel were experiencing, well, let's just say it would give rise to passionate thoughts because what had always worked for Israel before didn't work anymore. It did not work anymore. <coughs> Things just weren't the way they were supposed to be. You know, if you look at the story of Israel, you start with creation, and then you get the old stories, and then eventually you hit Abraham and Sarah and their lives, and everybody goes to Egypt, where eventually they become enslaved. And then God acts mightily to deliver them. And that sets off this chain of events, stories you probably remember from your Sunday morning education hour, where God is with Israel, Israel in the midst of conflict. God dispatches the pharaohs, chariots, and horsemen. God levels the walls of Jericho. Heck, you read parts of the Old Testament, it sounds like, well, tales of the old Pittsburgh Steelers team just leveling opponent after opponent. And God's there, kind of like quarterback Terry Bradshaw, making them seem invincible. And I didn't like the Steelers <laughs> at all. Just ask Goliath how much fun it was to go up against an almost pretty shepherd boy who happened to have God on his side. Didn't work out so well. From the time of the Exodus to the time of David and the long beyond, military accomplishment went hand in hand for Israel with devotion to God. And this made the Jewish people think that Jerusalem, where God, after all, sat in God's holy temple, would truly be beyond defeat. But it stopped working. Babylon sacked Jerusalem three times. And the last time, they took all the smart people, including the prophet Isaiah, 
and carved them off to Babylon, where they could keep an eye. This left very real questions in the hearts of those who were left behind. Where was God? Was the Babylonian God stronger than their God? Had God just left the building? Did God just leave Israel behind? Jeremiah, sent by God to minister to these left behinds, had a big job. First, Jeremiah makes it clear that thinking the presence of God in the temple in Jerusalem will always make Israel safe from a military perspective is wrong. God's first concern is not the sovereignty of Israel, at least not the way we think about it. Yes, God gave them the land, but God would take it away. Especially if that meant getting Israel back on the right track. A track they had fallen off of a long time ago. Tracy, can I have that text? These words are really important in this. If you truly amend your ways and your doings, if you truly act justly one with another, if you do not oppress the alien, the orphan, and the widow, or shed innocent blood in this place, and if you do not go after other gods to your own hurt, then I will dwell with you in this place, in the land I gave of old to your ancestors forever and ever. Otherwise, as God makes quite clear in the rest of the text, forget it. All bets are off. In other words, treatment of others on the part of Israel is linked to God's treatment of Israel. Loyalty to God is linked to God's treatment of Israel. And I think this is important to remember right now. As this idea leaks into politics, even today, that you always must stand with Israel because Israel will always have God on its side. Opinions about that side. If you are going to look at this from a biblical perspective, you see that God holds Israel accountable. And these words here are a pretty good summation of God's rules. Thank you, guys. You can take this. Those words would have provoked a lot of ire on the Facebook page. Let me, let me promise you that. Because for a lot of the Jewish people, God was just supposed to be there. God was supposed to be perfectly happy with sacrifices and worship services. That was supposed to ensure Israel's protection. The Davidic kingdom was supposed to be permanent. There was supposed to be a king at all times on the throne in Jerusalem. Suffering, persecution, punishment, none of that was supposed to be in the game plan. This was not the way things were supposed to be. But despite all that's going on, there's a reminder. God has not left the village. Jeremiah is a sign of that. And God is in the midst of God's people, suffering with them, hearing their cry, and promising if they mend their ways. If they mend their ways, healing will come. Okay. So how do we take all this and apply it to our lives and to a day what we call Christ? I think we start by remembering our king was broken, wounded, pierced, tortured. We see Jeremiah working with Israel, and Israel wants the restoration of military power, worldly power. Our king was killed by everything we can call worldly power. Looking at our king, we're reminded that earthly power, which is so important to us, is not in God's eyes important, not real. Looking at our earthly king, we are reminded that God's purpose, which Israel was experiencing firsthand, is higher than the purpose of any human creation or nation. God 
God's purpose, which hopefully a strong nation will seek to serve, is service, love, and the treatment of those in our midst like brothers and sisters. Now, we can have very different ideas what kind of actions are spurned as we seek to fulfill God's world. What kind of actions come out of this? And those disagreements are very legitimate. But we have to remember, we don't get off the hook. If we're following Christ, we have to do justice and love mercy. And walk on the way to put our I have the industry. This is the image that we use this week in the email that went out to remind you it was Christ the King Sunday. I, I love this image. I went, that's beautiful. Kim, use that one. But you know what? I don't think Jesus would be caught dead for that. Right now. now, I think Jesus would be a little bit more like Francis, the poet. Wearing a simple garment, sneaking out at night, and serving the Lord. Jeremiah called the people of Israel brokenness. Jeremiah called the people to allow their stubborn wills to be broken so that they can serve the purpose of God. Jesus came, served the purpose of God, and was broken. And became our broken king. And saved our broken lives. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Not for a king. But thank God.